I would love to start by introducing our esteemed panel. So um, why don't we just start uh, from right to left uh, with Matthew. You guys just start by introducing yourself, your company, and why don't you tell me also your favorite mobile game? Okay, well, my, my name is Matthew Leopold. Uh, I head up BD and marketing on the global side for, for Yoda One Games. Um, uh, living in China for about six years now, and I've been with Yoda One for the past three and a half. Uh, I'd say my favorite game right now, man, that is really tough, dude. I don't... One of your own games, then. If it I mean, yeah. I love Rodeo. But... <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but yeah, sorry. Hey, everybody. My name is Xiang Lin. Um, right now, I work for a, a, a very small startup based in Beijing. So I'm, uh, I'm in the same shoes as a lot of the developers in the audience. Um, my favorite game. Um, I, I, I do. I, I am addicted to two uh, game targeting women. That, uh, um, in the name of market research, I spend on, I spend on average one hour every day on those games. <laughs> uh, one is Playrix uh, Gardenscape. Okay. A very women driven game. Another one is Social Points uh, Word Chef. Just uh, a lot of pleasure coming out of it. Playing it. Hi, my name is Juan Cho from 433. I head the global uh, business operation for our company. And um, my favorite game, I actually play a lot of Lineage, my competitor's game, <laughs> as well as uh, Clash Royale. Awesome. Yep. I'm Cassia Curran of the International Business Development Department of NetEase. Um, my favorite mobile game, well, I play on mobile, uh, would probably be Hearthstone. Still a massive hosting fan. Hi, my name is Mike Chang. I do investments and acquisitions for NCSoft, uh, focused in the West here. In terms of favorite games, uh, how many of you have iPhones? I don't know if you know this. You can go to settings and batteries and actually see what you spend the most time on. It's actually quite scary because <laughs> it tells you how much battery life you burn and then also what that means in terms of time. So I'm 46% 40, of my battery and 17.9 hours in the last seven days on EA Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. Wow. So I think I'm about to get fired. Um. <coughs> cool. Um, thanks for that. Um, so I guess uh, we have a couple of Chinese companies, a couple of startups, and some Korean companies as well. Um, obviously, coming from Asia, we have some success stories there. Um, I'd love to kind of hear from you guys about why, uh, maybe first of all, what's your most successful, um, I'd say, corporate story that you can share uh, from Asia, and then why are you now kind of looking elsewhere? Um, Feel free to jump in, anyone. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> no, so uh, uh, we've been focused at, at Six Waves at, in publishing games in Asia. And um, with that success, actually, a lot of partners have asked us, um, hey, can you also help, help us overseas? Because things are becoming more expensive, more competitive. Um, so now we're actually looking to help um, game developers launch their games uh, in English-speaking territories as well. So I'm sure some of you guys probably have similar experiences. Yeah, in? I can jump in. I mean, yeah. in a similar vein, um, we were very China focused before, and um, about a few years ago, we started speaking to a lot of indie developers that necessarily couldn't really get into China, but they're also trying to get into the global markets as well. And so we decided to also kind of expand a bit and started signing up a couple titles on the global side. Um, I think our first success would be um, Crossing Road, followed by uh, Rodeo Stampede. So is there something specific about China? Um, maybe you guys can, can add to this, but something specific about China that you guys think is really um, challenging for you guys, where you have to kind of look overseas or, or for your partners? Mm, I think when it comes to publishing games and developing games, uh, it's difficult for us to take the risk of developing something that's really innovative from ground up um, in terms of gameplay. Uh, we're very good at... Uh, the meta game, perfecting monetization, live ops, um, but something that's truly innovative, we do look to the West and uh, as well. Uh, for 433, uh, what is it? We start thinking about global expansion about three years ago. Uh, previously, we had a very uh, conservative approach. We thought that when our games are successful in Korea first, then we'll bring it overseas. Then we saw Sumner's War doing very well. Uh, they're not that successful in Korea, surprisingly, and it's doing hugely well uh, outside of Korea. So after that, we changed our business model. Um, we decided that we'll focus more globally. Um, and now we see the successes. Uh, last year, we have uh, 
two games that's doing quite well outside of Korea. You know, uh, NCSoft was founded by TJ Kim in 1997. Uh, core game there is Lineage. Lineage continues to make money today. Someone showed me a lifetime to date revenue chart and it was billions. It's insane. Um, NCSoft has also always had a presence in the West uh, starting around 2000. Um, and candidly, we've been behind in mobile. We just recently launched a few titles. Uh, Red Knight went up to number one on the charts. Lineage Red Knight went up to number one on the charts in Korea um, for a short period of time. And then Netmarble had a license and they did their own Lineage game. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's publicly available, but rumors are that the Red Knight game did as much as $5 million a day and the Netmarble game did as much as $200 million in a month. Um, and candidly, those are kind of fairly new efforts for us. So that's kind of recent success. We'll see what happens going forward. Cool. Um, so for the games that you guys are bringing um, to the West, um, can, maybe can you guys talk a little bit about the approach? Are you guys spending a lot of time to test the, test the games? Uh, domestically before moving overseas, or what's the approach uh, for you guys? Um, I think for NetEase, um, we're trying uh, several different approaches because we're not sure which approach is going to suit um, our strategy the most yet. So one one way we're uh, bringing our, our games overseas, we have a U.S. office that we established, uh, I think, two, three years ago. Um, so they have reskinned some of our existing successful games and released them in the West. Um, we've also been working with publishers, uh, smaller publishers, uh, a lot of them Asian, uh, who have experience bringing uh, Asian games to the West and um, are very familiar with our games. And we have also have some internal uh, China-led efforts as well. Um, but one of the most uh, successful uh, ways that we brought our games overseas. Uh, this is a little idios idiosyncratic, but uh, we've released our games untranslated uh, in various markets, and they've done astoundingly well. <laughs> so uh, our latest big hit on Myoji, our Yin Yang Shi, uh, we released that overseas on, in the original Chinese, and that got to number one grossing in Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's a pretty awesome example. And why do you think that that was able to get so high in the charts without any localization? you have any theories behind that? It's because those particular countries have a very large China diaspora. And we don't right. have necessarily access to uh, Chinese language entertainment in those countries. Okay, interesting. So you mentioned you have an a, a overseas office. Mike, obviously you're based in the Bay. Um, do you guys also have offices in the West, or what, how do you guys actually look to... Uh, for us, uh, we only have an office in Beijing, okay. uh, as well as uh, Thailand. Uh, right now, we're focusing on more Asia first. Okay. Uh, so, But when we do find right people to manage our overseas office, then we'll open up an office. So uh, we first identify whether we can make money in that territory. Then we'll try to figure out whether we could hire a right person. Uh, then we'll decide to open up an office in that sequence. So we have five offices in the West. Some of those offices make Western games for the Western markets. Um, at the same time, we have a publishing arm that takes Korean games and localizes them out here. And what does that mean? You've heard some of the presentations beforehand. Localization can mean uh, QA, translation, um, uh, all the different aspects of bringing game marketing, uh, user acquisition. We have always published uh, the Korean PC games out here, Lineage, Blade and Soul, Ion. Blade and Soul was a three-year-old game in Korea, came out to the West uh, a year or so ago, solid success there. Uh, we've also built out organic mobile studios, but a publishing arm. So we're gonna take some of the Korean titles, adapt them to the US market, and adjust them over. In terms of very <coughs> weird dynamics, I don't know if you guys know this, uh, there was some commentary about the art style of Korean games. These games are beautiful, they're also incredibly large file size games. Uh, you can plug in you know, a phone into your T a 4K TV and they would look beautiful. It's a gigabyte download. And they're okay with that over there. Can you imagine if we would accept gigabyte downloads out here in the West? We're always trying to aim for like 880 megabytes over the air downloads on Apple, a little bit less on Android, adding a little bit of overhead, keeping it under 100 megabytes. <coughs> they don't care over there. And so trying to convince development teams over there uh, to adjust to kind of reduce the, the size of initial downloads, 
it's quite an interesting challenge proposition. I mean, I'll just add to that. Uh, we had a game called Blade, uh, was, which was released about two and a half years ago. It generated about 130 million just from Korea. Uh, so it was quite successful. But the file size was over 1.2 gigabyte, initial file size. Now it's about two gigabyte. But in Korea, to download those games, uh, it only takes on a good Wi-Fi uh, like five minutes. So uh, it's really nothing. Uh, so naturally, uh, we knew that it would be an obstacle when we go out to the West. But, uh, but our, we thought that we'll just target the core audience who would, who would play these games. But we found out the conversion rate was extremely low. Uh, it was a disaster. So uh, now, um, like NCSoft, uh, our, one of our uh, strategies is reducing the game size, make sure that uh, people out in the West could download these games. So um, right now, we're targeting from 300 to 500 megabytes. Uh, for action RPG games. Which is still pretty huge, but <laughs> a little bit better. Uh, so from remember, from keep, a gigabyte yeah, to that's right. big. So keep your file size low, keep the build size low. Um, so what about in terms of, uh, you, you guys mentioned a lot of sort of really high quality, high production ARPG style games. Um, are there any other genres that you guys see in, um, from your portfolios or from developers that from Asia that maybe are um, attractive for other regions and territories? Well, generally, I think it is a challenge for us in China, uh, Chinese developers, because the Chinese market, um, we see that mid-core, hardcore titles are much stronger than casual titles, whereas uh, in the West, it's much more tend towards casual. Um, so that is definitely a challenge for us, bringing out our games, uh, whether it be ARPG or MRPG. Uh, we have various other hardcore, mid-core uh, genres as well. Uh, but very few casual games. Um, so, uh, but what we think um, might happen in future is that the Western market might tend more towards mid-core and hardcore going forward, and therefore our games will become uh, more palatable there to Western audiences. So said ask the audience, for those of you who live in the West, what's your favorite shooter on mobile? Exactly. What's your favorite racer on mobile? And there is nothing, and yet there are quite dominant shooters in mobile in China, nothing out here, an area for opportunity. And these are the things that we're hunting for to see if we can either make it ourselves or find third parties to partner with who have identified how to make those games successful in the West. Cool. Um, look, yeah. uh, I was just going to jump in here. Um, so, I mean, we actually do publish a lot more on the casual side, not on the kind of mid-core, hardcore side. And um, I mean, we have not had any success with any Chinese developers bringing them to the West. Um, I think that it, it's it's something that we're still working at, but um, it's interesting to see the development scene of China kind of mature and globalize a bit. And I know, I've been to a, several indie events recently where before I would see much more of the mid-core hardcore games that you just alluded to, but now you kind of see more indies starting to focus on the West and you see more of the, the pixelated artwork, you see more casual game concepts and even some innovation. So, I mean, I think that within the next year, it's it's you're going to find some, like, truly Chinese developers to bring their games to global market and, and hit up that casual mid-core market that you alluded to as well, where we kind of also saw the same thing where players of Rodeo Stampede, they're kind of used to that endless mechanic, uh, that lane mechanic of, of endless rate, uh, games, but they also have that freeform endless, which kind of takes that next step and matures the audience a bit more and grows the market into a much more mature and, and mid-core market. So we're also seeing that as well. I'd um, like to take a couple minutes to kind of flip things around. So rather than dwell a lot on, on what you guys are, are looking to do outside of Asia, I'm sure a lot of audience members here are interested in, in um, how they could potentially launch and, and publish their games uh, in, in, within Asia. So um, given that you guys are from China, Korea, et cetera, um, do you guys see great opportunities for uh, developers from, let's say, Europe or other parts of the world? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about this in quite a lot of detail. Um, so I would say it is becoming more and more difficult for Western developers to be able to bring uh, their games into China. Um, one reason, of course, is that the government regulations um, since last year have really tightened up. So now you kind of need a Chinese publisher to partner with in order to bring your games uh, into China. Um, and again, there's that mismatch of uh, Western games tending to be more casual and 
uh, Chinese game tends to be more mid-core, hardcore. Uh, I also think that the quality of uh, production values that Chinese developers can produce has really improved in the last few years. So I think in uh, three years ago, uh, the a Western developer that mobile games were much higher quality than in China. Now I think China um, is able to produce some really beautiful, um, really, really fun games um, that really have very strong appeal. Um, so finding games of sufficient quality to bring to China is quite tricky uh, from my perspective. And that having said, as I earlier mentioned, what we don't do very well is um, produce games that are very innovative. I do understand that in China we are, from, from you, we understand that uh, there are more and more innovation come from indie students in China, but uh, we always respected uh, Western students' ability to innovate. Um, and that kind of uh, uh, interesting new games that are fresh and unique and original, they can attract um, uh, Chinese audiences and they, uh, for us, they're able, uh, we're able to uh, attract a different type of user from the ones that we already have, the mid-core, hardcore users. Um, so, Shang, I'm just wondering for your studio, um, where are you looking to launch your games? And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about okay. that. Okay, well. um, I want to share with the audience that um, as a Chinese startup, uh, a very small studio, how we make the decision of targeting a global market instead of focusing on uh, China market. So the, uh, our studio uh, is uh, is founded by a couple of college buddies. So we know each other way back when. And uh, uh, I was I came into the game industry in 2011, uh, when uh, at the at the beginning of mobile game, the, and I witnessed the mobile game uh, market uh, from a, a complete blue ocean to being saturated in, and saturated in four uh, four or five years. So which is quite amazing. Think about how fast this whole market. Uh, grow and saturate. Um, what we have seen in China is that uh, uh, is absolutely the tighten government control of uh, game title release process. So in order for a startup like us to get the approval, it takes a very, very long time and there's a long queue. So for us, this time invested is something that we don't want to risk. And um, after that, after you get the government re uh, direct mobile game release approval, um, the other part is getting access to the market. And in China market, you have uh, a couple companies doing extremely well. Uh, for example, Tencent in the mid-core, relatively compared to NetEase, uh, like uh, relatively casual, right? Just compared to NetEase, uh, the game, uh, especially the big success in Yangshi. And then you have a Yoda one, um, uh, starting from publishing global, uh, really fun games and targeting super casual uh, players. And I've heard that re recently your Beijing office are, are starting to make uh, mid-core games. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we've always been able to publish the mid-core games in China. It's just on the global side. Yeah. The I think the biggest success, the, that the way you guys accumulated the biggest amount of user were from the early titles like the half Break, all those games. I dream sky. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> mix up. Um, yes. <laughs> So um, what I see is that, first of all, as a studio in China, what we, and, and, and another, abst uh, another aspect is that the Android market is not as uh, accessible, easily accessible as uh, developers because, um, um, because App Store, mark uh, Android App Store is very much segmented still in the case. So with all those information there, it, the cost of uh, uh, any startup publishing your game in China is quite high because uh, the, the user acquisition channel is controlled by a lot of the big, uh, big publishers. Right. And um, so, so the access to user is very different from a Western market. Uh, with all those information, we wanted to test our muscle and build our muscle to build truly global game. And we believe that good game is still uh, the key to this, to this industry at the end of the day. So instead of focusing on making a game in China, we want to uh, we want to build the muscle the hard way and, and truly build a global title. Um, that's, that's the reason of, of our decision. Another interesting factor is that the Chinese government recently tightened the control of uh, converting RMB to US dollar. Right. So which means that a lot of the Chinese capital 
are having difficulty uh, exchanging their money uh, and investing in foreign companies. So uh, with that, um, investing in Chinese startup that has global market would be a, a future trend. That's what I see it. Uh, I haven't seen that materialize in, in game industry, though, just because content, CP, uh, is no longer the favorite of investment in the past year. It's right. been a trend. But I, I see that as a short-term trend instead of a long-term. Long-term game industry, we will always have good content. Good game would always have uh, a market. So, uh, I mean, that's our decision to why we, we decided to, instead of focus on China market, we want to go global. Got it. Uh, on the other hand, as a female game, <laughs> game player, and I'm, uh, uh, I see a huge gap in the content in, in Chinese market uh, of, uh, of game that's are ca more casual. Um, my friend's kids, they are playing, um, they're playing all the global best games, and, and they're not really necessarily uh, publishing, being, uh, being published by any um, major uh, game publishers. Um, uh, because monetization is, model is different, so uh, it's not easy for them to get on to the top grossing chart, and it's not easy for those companies to get to the top uh, downloads. But good game is still good game. Um, so these are I games that they're just releasing globally, and then people yes. in China are so finding them. I, I, w I would say that App Store, uh, uh, Apple App Store, is a good indicator of the stats of yeah. uh, how user I mean, retention rate is still the key number you, that you should look for. Yeah. Uh, I see that there's a, still a big gap in terms of uh, female content, female-driven content, mm -hmm. and, um, and super casual content. Okay. So if, if you have a very good, solid game, and don't be afraid to bring it to, to those markets, right. and don't leave money on the table. Okay, cool. So you guys just mentioned a lot of hurdles with mainland China, but also some potential. Yeah. Um, Juan, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about Korea, given that it's such a massive market. And Mike, maybe you can chime in as well. Are there, is there anything that developers or publishers in the audience should be aware of? Or, or what's the climate? And what, what, what's uh, some good advice that you can share with them? So last year, um, right now, Korean mobile gaming market is about $2 billion. The size is about $2 billion. So it's not a small market. About The split is 80% Android, 20% uh, iOS. Uh, and last year, we, we believe that it, the market became a little bit saturated. Uh, we don't see the growth as we've seen before. And it especially hit uh, the Google, Apple guys as well, too. And so for them to increase the revenue, um, you could see them promoting more Chinese games, uh, more Western games within their app stores. Uh, and we believe that that's a healthy model as well, too, because if not, it'll be very action RPG-centric uh, app stores, and uh, they would alienate a lot of the casual users as well, too. So uh, you see the conscious effort by uh, Apple and Google to pro promote foreign games, and so I think it's a great opportunity to Western uh, developers to... Uh, to come into the Korean market. It's not an easy market. You have to localize well. Uh, you have to support well. But uh, if you do it right, um, the market is there for you guys. I have a number of colleagues who go out there hunting for Western content, uh, mobile content, to publish in Korea. <clears throat> Candidly, the bar's gotten really, really high for quality. And they have been challenged to find the right titles to take over. Um, with the recent successes of a few of these other games here, uh, our, our threshold for what we'll do out in Korea is is incredibly high. We're actually more amenable to finding things out in the West, which is, again, why we're building out. We've gone from nothing to 100-odd people in a year and a half uh, developing mobile games internally for the West. Interesting. So um, one example from our experience is that we find that in Japan, tastes are changing a little bit. Um, before, it was all about kind of RPG-style games, but now, because of some uh, very successful global games, the appetite for... Um, games with PvP type of elements is is um, rising in Japan. Can you guys talk a little bit about what types of games or or how tastes have changed in Asian markets and where do you think opportunities are for for developers? Um, the mar Chinese market is really hard because it changes much faster right. than uh, Western markets. So uh, maybe. Uh, one quarter I'm looking for a certain type of game, and the next quarter it's a different type of genre that's um, come popular. Um, so uh, the trends move very, very fast, and it's very difficult to predict. Um, I think there is a little bit of a trend 
um, towards uh, premium games being a little bit more accepted nowadays. Uh, they knew, China's been a free-to-play market for so long, but now... Tell us a little bit more about uh, Overwatch. Overwatch? Uh-huh. It's not very casual. Uh, no, it's not very casual. I, I know uh, a friend's kids is playing like like crazy over there, and sh- he used to be like the top uh, 100 ranking, and then and then her mom was really worried about her uh, school, <laughs> and then the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's no, huge um, there. we've licensed that from Blizzard Entertainment, and it's been incredibly popular. Mm-hmm. So we, we actually licensed all of uh, Blizzard Entertainment's games: World of Warcraft and Diablo and Starcraft too. Um, so uh, we've been really pleased that Overwatch has been a, a big success um, in China. StarCraft 2, actually, funnily enough, wasn't quite as popular as we expected it to be, um, probably because all the Korean players were already fantastically good and beat all the Chinese players, so I don't think they ever quite got that traction. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, we're always looking... For, we, we have a really strong partnership with Blizzard, and we look forward to partnering in the future with their future games too. So um, as publishers, maybe um, for the developers in the audience, maybe what would be like the, the key tidbit or, or one key piece of advice that you guys can share for these guys if you're thinking about launching uh, a game in Asia? Well, I mean, just I wanted to say that I think it's strongly made it seem like casual games are in really impossible to launch in China right now. And they, they are, but they have to get creative. And I, just, yeah. I don't want to deter all these casual developers yeah. from like, pitching the, the game for China, because I really think that there is a market for it. And a lot of the app store, there are new app stores coming up uh, every month or so where they're focused more on the casual side. They're featuring more casual games. The way it used to work was that these guys want to make their quotas every month. They want to put in the games that have the higher ARPU that are going to make those, the, get their numbers up. And it really kind of alienated a lot of casual games for the past year and a half. And um, right now we're seeing that there is a market. There is a, players love these casual games. Yeah. It's just that as a publisher, it's hard to monetize off them. Yeah, <laughs> and so it really is. It really is difficult, and that's why we work with a lot of these guys on both the global and the China side because it makes a lot more sense, and we can do a lot bigger job for them in glo- China as well as the global side. So I definitely think that casual games are are, are here to stay in China, and they're going to keep growing. It's going to be bigger, um, and there's definitely a lot more opportunity to come. Uh, it's the same situation in Korea as well. Uh, you, I mean, if your goal is between top 20 to top 50, there's definitely room for you guys. Um, obviously, try to enter the top 10, top 15. It's very costly. You have to localize it well. You have to support it well. But uh, if your expectation is between 20 to 50, uh, there's huge opportunities. Uh, obviously, you have to invest. You have to localize the game because not many uh, Koreans can speak English. So, uh, yeah, definitely... Uh, People are looking for innovative games as well, too. Uh, something casual. Um, it always works. You see that with Chinese games, uh, because before, like two years ago, you really didn't see a lot of Chinese games in the Korean app stores. But uh, the last year, year and a half, uh, you see more innovative uh, action RPG games um, or innovative games coming out from China. And it's doing fantastically well in our market. So a lot of the games that you mentioned are... are games coming from China into Korea. Can you think of an example of, a, let's say, a, an overseas game from Europe or, or North or South America succeeding in Korea? Uh, well, you see, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on mobile, you, you always see the big guys, the kings, the supercells, uh, and, and all that. So, uh, and they did uh, invest a lot in, in Korea, uh, whether it's marketing or live ops. So uh, now, uh, they're getting their rewards for sure. If I could, for the audience, just know what you don't know or be aware of what you don't know and be willing and able to ask for help. Um, there are different tastes and preferences across region. NCSoft has always worked with partners in China. Most people know us for Tencent uh, for some of our games, but we worked with other partners out there. Our Lineage Red Knights game, we gave it to a Chinese developer to do what they would with it candidly. Um, We've been contemplating doing the same, giving the game out to the West, not only, even to our own internal studios, but finding partners to work with to help us out. Um, so just, yeah. just know what you don't know. <coughs> Be willing to ask for help. Plenty of people are here to, to give that advice and to work with you in that regard. So finding a partner is pretty, sounds like it's pretty critical, especially for China, Korea, given the, the, how different the market is. Are there any markets that you guys see, could be in Asia, could be somewhere else in the world, that 
you think is actually okay for, for a developer to kind of try to self-publish or, or try to launch a game without a local um, partner? Well, we see a lot of good successes, Western games as well as Korean or Chinese game in Taiwan or in Thailand. Uh, they're very acceptable uh, for other type of games. So uh, you, see a, you see a very healthy split uh, in the Taiwanese market. A third might be Chinese, another third might be Korean um, games. The remaining third will be a Western game. So uh, I think Taiwan, Thailand is very similar as well too. Um, I actually think that Taiwan is a super competitive market <laughs> just because uh, I want to play the friendly devil's advocate. Um, Taiwan, uh, like you said, accept all cultures, especially games from different regions, different styles, Western, Chinese, Korean, Japanese. And just because of that, it became a super competitive market. And because there's no language barrier between mainland China and in Taiwan, so a lot of the developers, when they have moderate success, the first thing they think about is going to uh, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong. And, um, and Singapore, those markets. So those market becomes their easy reach uh, for them. That make the, uh, the bar really high. So in 2011, I actually got the honor to work with Steven's company, Six Waves, in my previous uh, startup. And uh, we had a, one, uh, like, uh, a huge success. Uh, like, uh, like many game companies, when we were successful, we, it was a lot of time, it's timing. And in Chinese, we talk about, uh, uh, means that timing and the big market trend is number one important in your success. The second one is location. The third one is people in that orders of importance. That's a uh, Chinese saying. Um, uh, and at that time when we got the huge game in, in mainland China, um, we didn't have the bandwidth. Like many startups, we have to, you have to choose your battle. Uh, you either don't have a success or you have an, an accidental success that's beyond your expectation. Suddenly, every resource is pulled into the one region that you are making the biggest amount of money. Uh, we were lucky to find Six Whiff at that time to publish our game in Taiwan. At that time, because the expectation was so high, we didn't know just going from mainland China, a huge game, how difficult it is to conquer Taiwan market. Uh, once we worked with several different publishers in the regional best at that time, uh, we realized that even from China going to Taiwan and, and maybe Vietnam, a lot of the players are uh, Chinese Vietnamese. And even that, uh, going across different regions is difficult. Uh, Six Wave did a pretty good job at that time, Thanks. and I'm still very grateful. <laughs> um, I didn't pay you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't pay me to say that. Uh, but uh, the point is that uh, because the local market is extremely competitive, I, I actually do recommend finding partners, especially in, in Korea and China. It's very, very uh, different market. So having a partner is critical for your success. Um, uh, different re other regions, uh, feel free to test the market, but it's not easy. Yeah, I was just going to add in, I mean, actually as of yesterday, now it's pretty much impossible for foreign companies to enter even on the iOS side um, China, so you really, really need a local partner in China now. They're, they just slapped this on, and I, I had a dev partner of mine give me a call and say, look, we got this now, um, we can't launch our game in China to even test it, and this was yesterday he found this out, so... Just for the audience, recall that you have an advantage too. You understand the Western markets. You provide access in a way. Frankly, we've been talking to a NetEase company uh, or a NetEase back company that's doing a PC game. They have a, we think it's a very interesting and compelling and beautiful game with a high amount of Asian style art. Candidly, we don't think it'll work well here, but we're talking to them about partnering to publish the game in the West and literally changing the art style to Western art, right? There are opportunities for you to take advantage of great games over there and make money out here as well. That's a really good point. That's a good point yeah. um, so for for China, one more note. I mean, if you look at the top ten grossing games, I mean, it's pretty much Netties or Tencent. Um, even if we, uh, let's say, uh, I have a game and I wanted to to uh, try the China market and work with a partner, what would your advice be to kind of break through? Maybe not necessarily top ten, but maybe below that to let's say you know. 15 to, to 50 range. Is there an opportunity that you guys see that, that people haven't been uh, able to, to realize yet? Um, I think it is, it's, 
it is a pretty uh, challenging for sure for Western developers to hit even uh, those areas, although I don't think impossible. Um, I think um, just as ever, you know, good game is a good game and uh, quality is incredibly important. Um, so um, there is still opportunity in the Chinese market. Um, uh, and certainly if you have a very good game, uh, then you can hit at least top 50. Okay. What about other uh, regions outside of Asia? Are you guys looking at any, um, let's say, fast-growing or, or you know, um, new territories to bring your games into? We talked about the U.S. before, but are there any other countries or regions that you guys see as high potential or uh, in the future? Sure. Uh, for us, uh, we mainly publish or develop action RPG games or mid core games, and we see... Of course, U.S., because of the volume, we always see good revenue. But uh, outside of U.S., is usually Germany, uh, in that order, uh, then France. Uh, but of course, for these two uh, territories, you really need to localize uh, the languages. Interesting. Yeah, we, we have similar kind of story for, for Germany for action games. So, well, How about, um, let's say, casual games, Matt? Any, any? Casual games, I think that... Um, Universally, they're pretty well ac accepted. I think that it really just depends on the strength of the monetization in, in those markets. So um, we're definitely seeing a, a larger presence in a lot of LATAM LAT areas and stuff like that. But honestly, the monetization is still not really there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there, there, there are a lot of a potential for those types of areas. Like that. Yeah. So when, um, when I kind of routinely scan the charts in, in the U.S., for example, I always see a few random games from China. Some are localized, some are not. I see one or two Arabic games as well. There's um, an Arabi uh, Arabic game. It's yeah. always there. I can't... So I can't. can you guys talk a little bit about that? <laughs> What's going on there? Um, how can you guys explain a completely unlocalized game getting into the top grossing charts in, in the West? Any theories or, or info that you can share? Well, it's pretty much the <laughs> Chinese di diaspora okay. in our case, yeah. Really? really? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, <laughs> just there's a lot of uh, Chinese people abroad, and uh, there's no, maybe they're living in a country where the language isn't, uh, they don't have access to, say, Chinese language cinema and so forth. So uh, games are relatively cheap entertainment um, and very accessible. Okay, so it's just a matter of having good content in the native tongue that. That yeah, I mean, if find. their friends back in China are right. all playing that, and they're following Chinese news, then they get to know about these games pretty organically. So have you guys had experience in, let's say, um, bringing your games to other territories without any localization? And, and um, how have those games performed? No, you always localize? <laughs> okay, all right. Can we? No, we're not. We're, okay. we, in fact, we layer on dozens to hundreds of people to localize. So. Okay. I will say this: um, my my daytime job is to find companies to buy in, uh, to buy or, or invest in, um, and so I'm always scanning the charts every day. Um, uh, and my colleagues are asking, always asking me when we see these different things pop up that are quite untranslated: is it fraud? Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were certain games that boosted way up to the top of the charts. You can definitely tell when there's no reviews on the game. When it is all in Chinese, no reviews, version one, that is fraud. I had some friends say, well, what about this kind of symboled game here? It's a NetEase symbol. They didn't know what this was. It's like, no, this is actually a diaspora playing this game. So it is fascinating. You mentioned one game in Arabic. That's an interesting one to keep an eye on. Yes. Yeah. It's been up there for a while. I know. Yeah. I can never read it. And there's a whole lot of speculation as to does anyone play? Right. <laughs> interesting. I mean, I personally, I'm, I've heard stories of companies actually spending tons of money within their own games. Um, in order to drive it up the top grossing charts because actually, this is kind of crazy, but it's actually more cost effective than traditional uh, user acquisition, right? So it's cheaper to actually spend money in your game to, than to actually... Uh, so, so even beyond that, yes. there have been some instances where certain companies use the app stores to wash money with a 30% discount. So how should we describe this? Unclean money gets used to, to purchase uh, in-app purchases. Apple and Google take a 30% cut, and the money that washes out is 70% clean. 
Okay. Interesting. All right. Lots of stuff happening. Okay. Well, I just want to I just want to jump in back back to localization quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, but we actually found the most success, and we found this through like A-B testing on Google Play and everything like that, was we actually hired local people, not like uh, lo um, localization companies, but actually local people or players that want to help out translating the game. And that we found, like we A-B test that compared to what we originally used from a big translation company or a localization company. And it's amazing the, the, the metrics that we get on the one that's new, and we swap it out immediately. I mean, it's oh. like cool. local everywhere. Like I would go local wherever you're going. Okay. <laughs> Good idea. So if you have the resources and time to localize your game, it sounds like that's a really good approach to, to kind of resonate with local players that may be overseas. Yeah. Um, so what about in terms of other platforms? So you guys mentioned, obviously, Apple, Google Play. Um, are there any platforms that you guys see um, that developers should keep an eye on? So, I mean, just as, as an example, in Korea, I read about one store. I'm not sure how that's doing. Are there any other sort of, um, sort of new opportunities that you guys think people should keep an eye on in terms of platforms? Yeah, I would say that um, moving forward, Steam in China is going to be pretty big. It's right now the second gr highest grossing market for them. And it's been growing like wildfire the past year. And a lot of it has to do with the way the, the PC um, app stores are set up in China. And, the, and then a lot of it has to do with uh, Steam adopting certain payment um, methods for, for Chinese players. But it's a huge growth and it's definitely something that we're exploring in a very similar vein to how we help bring for mobile developers, we're also helping a lot of uh, uh, developers on the Steam side as well. And we're going to see how that, I mean, it hasn't fully been proven. We've done it with one title that we, we kind of did as a one-off for a partner that we've done worked with for a while. And they, they reported 4x times in revenue just oh. after the translation. It, was, it took two weeks, for, two, ga two game designers, two weeks, and 4x revenue um, growth. And, and then so we're going to actually, in official capacity, work on their second version of that game and do like voiceovers and, and pure localization and visual. And, and right. stuff like that. So this is a mobile title, which was then translated to Steam or just? No, this uh, was a PC title. PC. So we worked, okay, we worked with this particular team on the mobile side at first, and then okay. uh, they gotcha. went to PC. And Very cool. Very interesting. Yeah. Any other insights? Well, one store in Korea is a carrier store, actually. And it competes directly with a Google Play Store. So. Uh, it's not too advisable to work with one store because uh, either you have to choose between Google or uh, one store. And one store, the reason, um, it has about 10% of market share in Korea. And the reason uh, it attracted a lot of uh, users, or core game users, because uh, there was a lot of cashback reward. Um, that was the main incentive. That's why people would come on uh, just for that cashback incentive. But cashback for the players? or For, for the players. Okay. So uh, you would, you would uh, yeah, like you would spend uh, $50 and... Uh, they'll refund you in that way. Wow. So uh, that's how we retain the, the audience or the customers. Most people in, in, that attend Cash Connect, I think, think about mobile first. Uh, some people think about PC, client PC, or browser PC. Some people remember Facebook six or seven years ago. You know, there's still a lot of money made on Facebook today. A lot of people forget console. Um, as difficult as it is in, say, China, just remember, you know, Sony is in Japan. They've got the PlayStation there. And also the other thing to think about are the chat apps, right? Um, and for those of us who live in the West, we often forget what can be done there and what are the opportunities. I had a friend who was a Tencent biz dev, and I had a company come in. They were doing HTML5 apps. Candidly, I don't want to have anything to do with HTML5 in the U.S., not anytime in the very near future. But, you know, I asked my friend at Tencent, hey, would you care about an HTML5 game app? He's like, no, why would I think about this? Next week, he calls me up. My guys out there asked me to find more HTML5 games. Can you send me this company, right? You just never know uh, what we'll take. And obviously, there's so much money to be made on the chat apps out that way. Very cool. I want to comment on something still a little bit early, so the money is not there yet. But um, uh, as a developer, it, it's something wa worth paying attention to. So. Uh, in, in China, the, uh, most of the hardware companies are, uh, are spending money um, in, in VR game on the lower end, uh, end side. Recently, not that I'm doing that, but uh, uh, recently there's a research report published saying that uh, China has been the biggest buyers in terms of hardware, and the outlet is mostly porn uh, for v virtual reality content. Um, so, and that number already surpassed U.S., which is, hey... Uh, um, but um, that is something uh, with the uh, economy uh, uh, right now. Uh, a lot of the VR gears, especially branded VR gears in in, in China, Xiaomi, uh, are 
uh, are positioned at about uh, sub ten dollars, so six dollars as the as the uh, equivalent to the box. Uh, um, and then uh, let me convert it to RMB to US dollar, about about twenty US dollar for the uh, higher end version. So with that um, uh, price tag, a lot of the uh, workers in China, where they really don't have a lot of entertainment, and buying something like that could be just a one-off thing because the content is not there yet. Um, but with that money, they can spend this money, go back home and brag about, hey, this is what I bring home from Shenzhen factory. And it could be just like a, a Chinese New Year gift, uh, it, but it will be a, a show-off event. And um, the first wave of content are uh, concert and sports, um, and uh, a lot of the big companies are already heavy, heavily invested in that, and, and those market, uh, small companies don't have access to it. However, it's worth um, keep an eye on the number of active gears out there, and I think the number will grow. How fast it will grow, I, I wouldn't trust any of the market research uh, forecast, but it's something definitely worth uh, uh, keeping an eye on. Are you guys looking at VR as well? And the we look. We have one game greenlit in Korea for Oculus. Yeah. Um, candidly, most of the VR opportunities we've seen out there depend on supplements, uh, subsi subsidies to stay afloat, uh, whether it be from Oculus, from Sony, um, not as much from HTC. Um, so uh, I will say what has been fascinating, I'm personally involved with a few companies, uh, companies I was involved with this before, NCSoft, and Chinese funds have been investing in these VR companies. One of my companies uh, got money from uh, Chairman Chen, the former chairman of uh, Shanda Games. Um, again, that was for physical points of presence in China. Now we've seen what the ship volumes are, or assumed for HTC, for Oculus, for Samsung Gear. It's not enough in most cases to sustain profits just by launching the game without any subsidies. We hope that will happen over time. But it is possible to take cash from Chinese investors for physical points of presence VR content. We've seen a bit of that going on. Uh, NetEase has already released a uh, VR game uh, for Google Daydream. Um, and we also have uh, various other uh, VR games um, in development. Uh, we uh, have also made uh, a few investments in VR. Uh, not huge numbers of investments, but we've invested in uh, NextVR. Um, live streaming platform, um, Axum, which is um, hardware. So, um, yeah, it's, it's of interest, but again, the market is not there yet. So there's a little bit of watching and waiting occurring for us. Since the market isn't there yet, <laughs> we haven't invested in uh, VR, uh, whereas uh, we're investing heavily in AR. So uh, we're planning to uh, come out with an AR game early next year. Can you talk a little bit about how that AR game might work? Um, uh, I think it's a great opportunity for Western users uh, or Western companies to to come into Asia, especially Korea, uh, because Korean. Uh, if you look at Korean app stores, uh, it's not static. You you won't see the same top games um, beginning of the year. Uh, it won't be the usually it won't be the same games at the end of the year, uh, unless it's a really uh, well uh, sported game, such as uh, Lineage in uh, from NCSoft. Um, so uh, there's very many opportunities. If there's innovation, people would would enjoy it. Um, Pokemon Go is doing very well. It's just been released uh, recently in Korea because uh, Google Map issue in Korea. Um, but uh, we believe that uh, if there's innovation, especially uh, we know that uh, it's making money. Uh, is it is already in the top two um, grossing chart in Korea? So if there's innovation um, and uh, and the gameplay is good. Definitely, I think uh, the Western uh, developers have a big shot in succeeding in Korea. Cool. Um, well, we've reached the point where I think we're starting to need to wrap up. But um, with that, I would love to throw um, it to the audience. So you guys have been listening to us very patiently. Um, it's a pretty uh, well-represented panel here. So are there any questions from you guys about um, Asia versus the West, mobile platforms, um, opportunities for growth and revenues. Sorry, um, I think it's for Cassie. Uh, you um, you were just about to complete an answer about uh, premium in uh, in China and um, 
didn't get the answer really. I just wanted to sort of elaborate that you said that you saw uh, the potential that premium games were potentially about to um, make a comeback or grow better than uh, freemium games. And I just wanted to get your insight into that a little bit more. Uh, sure. Um, essentially, premium games previously were completely dead in China. Now they have come back somewhat a little bit to life. Um, I wouldn't say it's uh, going to be a huge opportunity. I don't think it's going to supplant free-to-play anytime soon, but um, certainly there's more opportunity than there was previously. I think that Chinese um, gamers become more sophisticated. Sometimes they um, want just a uh, beautifully polished game to enjoy on a one-off basis. Um, and it's still really to work. Yeah, we actually had one successful uh, premium game called League of Stickmen that we launched in China and uh, in global markets. Definitely did much better in China and in other Asian territories. Um, but it was also, we lowered the price point, which helped a lot. And that helped convert a lot of players where previously players wouldn't be willing to spend a dollar to download a game. But when you lower the price point like you can in the iOS store on iOS in China, players are converting pretty quickly on, on a, a, the equivalent of a 15 cent purchase. I mean, that's your premium game in China. And on Android, it's still going to be tricky and whatever. But it's definitely, a, there's a room for, for growth there and an opportunity as well. So um, I, I, got, I got a question for you guys. So um, uh, obviously some of you have really large teams and some have uh, smaller teams. So what, what do you do, quantify how many people is required to take a, a, a game that is local and go global with it? So more or less like the live operation side of it. So how many people will you put in a team to do that? It's a really good question. I, I, I would say it depends on the, the, the genre and, and style of game. For, for a casual game, I think it can be supported by a really small handful of, of, of people um, from wherever they may be. Um, I'd say for a really large strategy game, you, you're going to want at least a couple dozen developers, guys on the ground to, to do live ops and events as well. But um, please feel free to... Yeah, I, I would say that when we spin up a product team to work with our partners, it's typically they're on the more casual side, but um, it is around like 10 to 12 people that we'd spin up for a product team to complement their product team. Anyone else would like to answer? <laughs> Same for, for us, for a mid core game, we have about 15, 15 to 20 people that would support a game. Uh, I know that is a, is a huge number, but. Uh, but because uh, you constantly need to update the contents, um, sometimes you have to, uh, because it's a lot of time uh, marketing, uh, you have to have a, a bigger team to support the game, to localize those big game. One thing, uh, I'm mostly trying to play for the home runs. I have to do deals large enough that will impact the, the, the income statement and balance sheet of NCSoft. When I see startups coming in with, or not startups, but you know, young companies coming in with business plans that say, this is our staffing prior to launch, this is our staffing after launch, that doesn't read success to me, right? Ideally, if the game launches and does well, particularly in free-to-play, you would ideally see a larger staff uh, component for live operations to grow. Um, it's actually quite disturbing when I see staffing go down at launch. It's actually quite a scary, it telegraphs not a winning proposition, so to speak. So something to consider. And um, so, so since we are on the growth track, so how, how much do you spend in advertising? Um, is it something that you rely on a lot? In, in, in just some numbers that people understand how much is required. Yeah, I think um, it's pretty regular for publishers or developers to reinvest anywhere from 20 to upwards, much higher uh, of their revenues and, and to continue to scale a game. Um, I think depends on your, your risk appetite, but um, for Asia, the one thing that's quite different from the West is there is a huge amount of, of marketing spend um, on non-traditional sort of offline user acquisition. So TV campaigns, outdoor kind of stuff, um, things on the ground, because Asia is really, really tightly, densely uh, populated, so it is very, very effective to, to get eyeballs uh, offline. And and the main reason for that, uh, especially in Korea, is to, to reassure the user that we're spending a lot of money on this game. Um, so uh, what is it? The AR PPU is very high in Korea uh, for core games. And they're going to spend close to $60 to $100 a month on the game. So uh, for these users, they don't want to spend all these money and time 
and suddenly they see their game not being supported. So uh, if there's a huge media campaign or OH campaign behind it, they know that, oh, okay, this, this uh, publisher will really support this game. So uh, I don't mind investing that much money. You know, it'll be a uh, it'll be a less risky investment for the user. All right, I think that wraps it up. So uh, thank you very much for the panel. So everyone give a warm, warm applause. <laughs>